Lady Without Appetite by John Glogue she came aboard the cruising liner Avalon at Siriago, the drowsing, untidy port that gives the Republic of San Cristobal its only contact with the outer world. She created an immediate and sensational interest, welcome enough, for most of the passengers were feeling limp and inebriated in the sticky heat that paralysed the old Spanish main with the curse of permanent lethargy. She was the only additional passenger we had acquired since we had been cruising in those tropical seas, and she told us that she was visiting Europe. We were a mixed company. There was a young contingent addicted to non-stop whoopee. There were some elderly people who were seeing the world and finding it was hotter and noisier than they had imagined. There were the ship's officers, young, good-looking men of the type that is always hoping to find an heiress in the passenger list. Few heiresses marry ship's officers. The new passenger's name was Julia Hugo. She was quite the most remarkable-looking girl I had ever seen. Not very tall, about five foot five, with dull red hair. A glorious complexion, natural without a scrap of makeup and ice green eyes. An unforgettable face, so full of vivacity. She cooed at you in a deep and luscious voice that had a faint hint of cajoling American huskiness. No lacking American harshness. Her figure was incredible. So extraordinary indeed that it was almost inhuman. She appeared to have a 15-inch waist, yet she was not one of those slender, willowy people, anything but. She was generously, healthily built. That tiny waist gave her an air of frailty, something not quite normal, though in no way repellent. Nobody knew anything about her, but she hadn't been on board for more than 24 hours before every man in the ship had been talking to her, and I suspect that every woman wanted to cut her throat. We found, to our surprise, and I think some of the younger nitwit hearties were a little dismayed, that she was an unusual conversationalist. In half a dozen sentences she had practically everyone on board out of their depth, but pleasantly out of their depth, if I can put it like that. She talked about all kinds of odd and remote, almost dry subjects, not the sort of things people talk about on a holiday. If she hadn't been so dazzlingly lovely, I doubt whether many young men would have listened to her for more than five minutes. Her subjects ranged from biochemistry to Mayan art and architecture. She was superlatively well informed, and she flitted from subject to subject, touching upon everything with a dreamy lightless that often made the most difficult matter seem as engaging as society gossip. After four days, old Dr Langton, who had been hearing a lot from this young woman, said to me, Apart from her conversation, do you notice anything queer about Miss Hugo? If you were talking about her waist, I began. I am not said the doctor bluntly. I've made a list of her peculiarities. She's a non-smoker and a teetotaler. I've watched her carefully at meals and I've never seen her eating anything. She just pushes her food about on her plate and talks so much and gets so much attention from the people round her that nobody has observed that she hasn't put a bit of anything between her lips since she came on board. Maybe, I suggested, she's putting over the butterfly appetite act to build up additional allure. The doctor snorted. I'd like to know when she tucks into some nourishment, he said. It seems abnormal. He paused, then added, shouldn't be surprised if there's some dope history behind her. He shook his head and continued. She's got a considerable knowledge of flora and fauna of San Cristobal. I don't know what she was doing there, but I do know her stuff is right because twenty years ago I was on some fever research work down in that pestilential hole. There's something damn queer about that girl, if she is a girl. What do you mean if she is a girl? Are you suggesting that she's a man in disguise? There's something very fishy about it. 
I suppose a doctor is always going about diagnosing people's complaints and any physical peculiarity is just a challenge to his technical knowledge. Oh, as to that, there's quite a simple explanation, he told me. You see, those rather long limbs and the small trunk suggests a domination of the pituitary and thyroid functions. At least I think that's what he said. Years ago, before we knew quite as much as we now know about glandular dominations, there was a theory that a new type of human being was evolving, with long limbs and a larger head and the organs of nutrition and a chest and abdomen constructed on an altogether smaller scale. That was one of those nice, comfortable, late Victorian theories. Maybe there was something in it, and I've seen among the natives of San Cristobal some strange types. I should say that Miss Hugo has more than a touch of the tar brush in her. A bit of Indian blood, too. But those eyes, I objected, and that dull copper hair. I'm talking of general physical structure, explained the doctor. She may represent a new and better mixture, a higher type in process of evolution. Surely, I protested, you don't expect a new and higher type of humanity to come from Central American natives. He looked surprised. Why on earth not? he demanded. Do you think Europeans are the chosen race? They're such utter idiots and they're more than likely to kill each other off in another four or five generations. No, if new types are going to arise, I expect them to come from North Africa and Central or South America, perhaps from the Middle East. It's odd about Miss Hugo's lack of appetite, I said. It's more than odd, he agreed. If I didn't regard it as a silly word, I'd say it was uncanny. But I should imagine there's something queer about the whole of her physical makeup. Then he said something that illustrated the abominable detachment doctors always possess. I'd like a chance of operating on her, he said. Why don't you ask her if you're so darn curious? Ask her what, whether she'd like me to operate on her for her appendicitis or something? No, but as a doctor, say you're interested in a diet. Talk sense, said Dr Langton. I can't go about firing such questions at people in an arbitrary way, and we should probably find out that her stewardess brings her food at night, so that she can put up a show of day starvation, just for effect. Well, nobody seems to have noticed it except you. She talks so much, said the doctor, that maybe she hasn't time to eat. Well, you lose no opportunity of talking to her. She's not ill-informed, he returned. We had called at Jamaica, and the Avalon steamed towards the Windward Passage and put in at port au prince and so we were able to have a glimpse of Haiti. It was intensely hot, and we only stayed a few hours, but there were some energetic shore parties. We heard all the usual anecdotes about the Emperor Christophe, or King Henry, as he liked to be called, but Haiti has lost its mystery and romance since it was partly policed by the United States Marines, and neither the doctor nor I cared to go ashore. Rather to our surprise, Miss Hugo stayed on board also. The doctor remarked on it when, like every other male on the Avalon, he grasped a chance of a little conversation with this exotic creature. Surely, Dr Langston, she said, you're not surprised that I should prefer to remain on board. You must remember that I've lived in San Cristobal, oh, long enough for the tropics to have lost all their powers of attraction. You know, as a doctor, how debilitating these hot, brilliant lands are. I do, answered the doctor. I've lived in San Cristobal myself. I've also spent some time on Haiti. Not much on this side, over in Santo Domingo. They started to talk about Haiti and the books that had been written about the island that was once a French colony, and which for well over a century had been an Negro republic. I've no doubt that you have heard all about zombies, said Miss Hugo presently. I've heard of foolish legends, replied the doctor. I've also seen grave physical derangements, uh, progressive atoni. Exactly, cut in Miss Hugo. 
There's something peculiar about Haiti. The zombie legend has a pathological foundation. She became technical and the conversation passed above my head. I only began to understand it when Miss Hugo asked whether the doctor had ever known of any cases of zombies outside Haiti. I once heard of some people who went to the island, became affected after a few days and turned into zombies, she said. She paused then with a smile added, they were white people. Nonsense, snapped the doctor. I'm painfully ignorant, I said, but what are zombies? According to local belief, Miss Hugo told me, they are people who have died, who have been resurrected and who are merely automatons, poor, bloodless, shrinking and quite brainless creatures, empty shells, as it were, of their past selves. What rot, I remarked. The doctor smiled. It's not wholly without foundation, he said. There are peculiar types in Haiti, although I've never heard of zombies being exported. Miss Hugo smiled, and her vivid teeth made me feel that somebody had switched on a searchlight. That deep, slightly husky voice was pleasant to hear. You know, she said, I'm going to be a little unkind. I feel that many unexplained diseases, many peculiar physical types, are never reported or mentioned by medical men or published in medical papers. Doctors are great conspirators. They hush things up that can't be explained. Don't they, Dr Langston? You know too much, he answered. She became serious. Really, Doctor, I know nothing at all. I play about with theories and I have a little superficial knowledge. You see, I have a good memory and I soak up facts, rather like blotting paper soaks up ink impressions. But you'd find, if you cross-examine me about my knowledge, that like blotting paper, the impressions I soak up become a little distorted, a little fanciful. Are you trying to tell us that you've got an imagination? I ventured, because you don't have to, it's apparent. You're thinking of zombies, I suppose, she said. Well, yes, I admitted. I hope it's only imagination, she returned. Personally, I should hate to have any aboard as a result of this shore trip. Two days later, the doctor reminded me of that conversation. The Avalon was steaming slowly towards the Leeward Islands. The highlands of Haiti and Santo Domingo had faded into the horizon and we were making for the Leeward Islands on our way down to Trinidad. The doctor and I lounged in deck chairs. We'd just consumed two old-fashioned cocktails before dinner. There's something strange about young brothers, said the doctor. Have you noticed how he's going about looking as though he wasn't there? I've never seen a man look so vacant. You can hardly get a word out of him. And when he drinks anything, he goes through the motions like a machine. It's all nonsense, of course. But he really does remind me of a confounded zombie. Let's get this zombie business straight, I said. I thought they were always Negroes. I've never heard of a zombie who wasn't. You're getting fanciful. I shouldn't have believed that a hard-boiled old medical practitioner like you would be so impressionable. That wasp-wasted Julia Hugo has been giving you ridiculous, not to say unscientific, ideas. Well, I don't like the look of him, said the doctor. If I were a ship surgeon, I should make it my business to do something about a passenger who looked like that. But then, if I were a ship surgeon, I shouldn't be discussing the peculiarities of the passengers. I once did a voyage as a surgeon. He was in the middle of telling me about it when the young man we had been talking about strolled past our chairs. I say strolled, but he walked in a stiff, jerky way as though his legs were being pulled by strings. His face was chalk-white, and he staggered as he passed us. 
The doctor was out of his chair in a minute. You've got a touch of the sun, he exclaimed, grasping the other by the arm. The young man slewed round and looked at him with blank eyes. Then he collapsed. He slammed down on the deck as if he had been poleaxed. We got him to his cabin and the ship's surgeon took charge. Dr Langton had nothing to do with the case, of course, but I asked him for his views. What do you make of it, malaria? Malaria rubbish, he replied. It sounds ridiculous, but he's got some of the symptoms of pernicious anemia. Now he seems to have packed the development of the trouble into about 48 hours, which is plain nonsense. I should say his temperature is subnormal. The sick man progressed slowly, but while he became convalescent as we dodged about those jewel-like islands, two other young men developed the same symptoms. The ship's surgeon discussed the trouble with Dr Langton over drinks in his cabin. The conversation was involved, practically incomprehensible to a layman, but it was perfectly obvious that they were both puzzled. Maybe it's some new kind of bug, said the ship's surgeon, not very hopefully. Dr Langton said nothing about zombies, and neither did I. As we neared Trinidad, it grew hotter, and I found it difficult to sleep at night. I generally managed to doze for a couple of hours after six in the morning, but I took to wondering about the deck at night in pyjamas, searching for coolness. It was on one of these nocturnal perambulations that I ran into Miss Hugo on the boat deck. She was alone, and she was wearing a white silk wrap. At least I thought it was white, until we met face to face, and in the strong silver moonlight I saw the front of the wrap was stained, and the stain was spreading and darkening. "'Good Lord, Miss Hugo!' I cried. "'Have you met with an accident? "'Do you know you're covered with blood?' "'She looked at me, and I had a creepy feeling "'that she was another victim of the zombie complaint. "'She had the same blank, mindless look on her face. "'The moonlight was strong enough to read newsprint "'so that every feature was clearly distinguishable. "'What's the matter?' I cried, and grasped her by the shoulder. She said nothing. She had an air of vacancy, and yet about her eyes there was something ecstatic, an air of fulfilment and satisfaction, yet she was dumb. She reeled as I touched her and would have fallen, but I caught her and carried her down to the promenade deck. There was a deck steward on night duty, and I hailed him. Together we carried her down to her cabin. The white wrap was dripping with blood. Her face and neck and hands were smeared with the stuff. We dug out a stewardess and fetched a ship's surgeon. I was horrified and wondered whether she had been stabbed or if some frightful accident had happened. I went to Dr Langton's cabin and found that he was awake reading and smoking a cigar. I told him about Miss Hugo and he got up and put on a dressing gown. It's mad ridiculous nonsense, of course, he said. And I've never come across it yet outside natives, but... He stopped and then said, I'm going to have a word with the surgeon. I returned to my cabin worried and distressed. Miss Hugo had been as light as a feather to carry. I wondered what could have attacked her, what tropical scourge could have struck her down and produced that flow of blood. I got to sleep about six o'clock, and after a light breakfast, I saw Dr Langton. "'Come to my cabin,' he invited. "'I want to talk to you.' "'Do you know,' he said, when we were settled in his comfortable state room, "'there were no wounds of any description on Miss Hugo. "'There was nothing to account for that blood. "'She was unconscious, and when she woke this morning, "'she was normal and without recollection of her night adventure.' whatever it was, but I'm going to talk to her. He did. We managed to get her to herself, and Dr Langton said, You know, Miss Hugo, you and I have lived in this part of the world. Lots of things happen in Central America and in the West Indies that aren't believed elsewhere. 
Now, if you don't mind, I want you to help me clear up one or two things. When and what do you eat? Miss Hugo smiled. You are awfully direct and terribly observant, Doctor, she replied. I don't really know what it has to do with you, but I don't mind admitting that I don't eat. Wasn't it H.G. Wells in one of his romances who invented some creature that had eliminated the digestive organs? I think his phrase was that these creatures, oh, they were Martians, weren't they, were above the organic fluctuation of mood. Well, so am I. I absorb my nourishment. Oh, injections, said the doctor. What is the drug? She shook her head. I don't use drugs, she told us. What do you use? For the first time, her deep, rich voice repelled me as she replied. Blood. The doctor sat up. I thought so, he said, although it seems quite crazy. You know what would have happened to you in the Middle Ages? People were very ignorant then, Doctor. They didn't approach this question of nourishment in, shall we say, the scientific spirits of the 20th century. I wondered why you were interested in zombies, the Doctor continued. Have you by any chance been through that stage yourself? I am a zombie, she replied, but with a difference. Oh, no, you're not, he said. You're a very rare creature. Only a few freaks like you are born every century, generally in southeastern Europe. She murmured, Doctor, you interest me enormously. Please go on talking. You rather hoped that we'd talk about zombies, didn't you? You'd mark down those three men as your, what shall I call them? The name I always use is reservoirs. Exactly. You'd mark them down knowing that the uh, transfer you desired to effect in order to secure your nourishment would produce in them a zombie-like condition. As you know, when people lose a lot of blood, they become extraordinarily weak. But your technique caused other effects as well. At this point, I interrupted and asked them what they were talking about. So I was completely bewildered. The doctor said, if you were familiar with Scoffin's suggestive work, Stray Leaves of Science and Folklore, or that more recent study of survivals, Lawson's Modern Greek Folklore, an ancient Greek religion, you might be able to understand that this woman belongs to another race, one of those by-products of evolution, which, like the Neanderthal race, represent a blind alley in human development. She is an up-to-date version of something that Europeans used to call a vampire. Much too crude retorted Miss Hugo, no ingeniously tricked out in your scientific mumbo-jumbo. Now, I should describe myself simply as a practitioner of and a believer in direct nourishment. How do you do it? asked the doctor. She smiled, and I suddenly noticed her teeth. I believe in traditional methods, she said. They have never been bettered, and injections are such a nuisance, aren't they? The doctor nodded, and you have developed in this way. Did you begin as a child? I can't remember, she said. It was so long ago. I began to think that I was insane, but Dr Langton's gravity worried me. You'll have to stop it, you know, he said. Doctor, dear doctor, cooed Julia Yuko, do you want to condemn me to death? Remember, I'm more human than most of my kind. I always stop in time. I never carry things to their logical conclusion. I borrow from my victims. I don't condemn them to death. She smiled and left us. In a few minutes, she was surrounded by a usual court of young men, talking, talking, selecting a fresh 
reservoir. Oh, what raving nonsense it all is. Dr Langton has disappeared. I don't know what to think. I have tried to see Miss Hugo, but she evades me. There is another case of a passenger behaving like a zombie. A really tough young man. I don't know what to do. There is a great anxiety about Dr Langton, and the ship's officers fear that he must have fallen overboard. Perhaps he was looking at the sea and grew giddy. Perhaps, perhaps... I don't know what to think. Well, said the captain of the Avalon, looking at the purser, after he had finished reading the neatly written diary. Well, this is a hell of a proposition for our reputation, all these passengers going down one after another with this mysterious complaint, a perfectly respectable doctor disappearing overboard, and his friend, obviously as mad as a hatter, disappearing too. Nice sort of diary to leave behind, isn't it? It'll sound awfully well at the court of inquiry. Well, I suppose the poor fellow is better dead. He'd have been in a loony bin if he had lived. The purser rubbed his chin. I suppose, he said, that Miss Hugo isn't a vampire. The captain reminded him in a quite unprintable way that he was living in the 20th century.